But yeah, we're working on our, our series called Team Colors, um, which we've done two weeks of, and it's been really fun um, just talking about who we are as the church and what that looks like. Um, and so, yeah, I'm excited to talk to you about fellowship, irresistible fellowship. Um, so I'm just going to pray for us. Thank you, Jesus, uh, for your church. Jesus, we thank you. Um, yeah, even though it's messy and we fail um, and it's hard sometimes, Jesus, that you love your church, um, Jesus. And so I just pray you bring us into that. Um, just show us your heart for your church tonight. Um, Lord, give us your eyes for each other. Um, yeah, Jesus, just bless us tonight um, with who it is, who you are and who you say that we are. Um, and yeah, let us extend that onto each other. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so our passage for tonight is from John 13, verses 33 to 35. And it says, My children, I will be with you only a little bit longer. You will look for me, and just, just as I told the Jews, so I will tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Um, and this passage comes just after Jesus washes his disciples' feet and uh, then he predicts his betrayal as well in that same chapter. Um, and so he's talking to his disciples that have walked with him, that believe him, that know him. Um, and so it's his followers. And so what this means for us is that the one another means believers. It means us and the church um, and it means everyone else that will see it, that's, that's everyone outside of the church. So that's the lost, the non-believers. Um, and we know that Jesus wants his church to be unified. He wants us to be family. And we together, every denomination, every church, every expression, um, we're the bride of Christ. And um, we can look at the global church and just the state that it's in, and we can feel like we're almost known for our disunity and um, the things that we disagree on and, yeah, just the, the disillusion and the, like, conflict um, within the church. Uh, and, yeah, if you've been in the church for a while, you've probably been affected by this in some way as well. And we can read in Acts 2, verse 44 to 47, which I didn't bring up for you guys, I'm really sorry. But um, we see in that, and we just like long for what the early church was. And um, it, to it just talks about the believers that had everything in common, and they shared everything that they had, and they broke bread in their homes with glad and sincere hearts. Um, and as a result, people were added to their number every day. Um, and so we long for that. And, and the only reason that they had like multiple church gatherings was for like just convenience of location and space. And to me, that's just like, oh, that's just so what we long for. Uh, and it just sounds impossible to get there when we look at where we are today. Um, and it's one thing to talk about disunity, but there's also a, a sense of disconnection as well in the church. Um, and it's, it's just really lovely to be standing here and looking at so many familiar faces. And um, Haley and I actually were just talking this week about just how beautiful community in Alice has been lately and um, just seeing different churches coming together. And it's been really, it's been just really beautiful expression of that. Um, and there's been just powerful fellowship. Um, that I'm really grateful for, like just even for me personally. Um, but I know from my time in Alice that that's actually quite tricky because this is such a come and go place. And we've probably all been affected by that in some way. And most of us moved up here with, you know, a sense that the Lord has sent us here or has brought us here for a purpose and we came with this sense of purpose. And I believe it's just such a scheme of the enemy to distract us um, and to just delay us from doing what he's asking us to do um, by, yeah, by using 
and distracting us with with our beliefs about ourselves and about each other and and just kind of this this isolation um and yeah because I, I guess like Maybe you can relate, like if you've been here, if you're new here, then it can be really hard to make friends. And if you've been here a while, um, you've probably seen some people go. And so there's that sense of like even trying to do it again and make friends again, like that's really hard. And so letting people in becomes becomes difficult. Um, and so we can, we can do that. We can isolate ourselves and we can feel this disconnect. Um, and it's real, it's hard. It makes church hard. And that's not what God wants. And it's so, it, you can just see how that's such a scheme of the enemy to make church hard and to make that a distraction from what the purposes of the church really are. Um, and a book that has really helped me to understand the spiritual warfare that is on the church is The Screw Tape Letters. Um, now, if you don't know The Screw Tape Letters, it will come across a little bit weird. Um, but it's C.S. Lewis. And um, I love it. It's, it's really um, just been so rich for me. But so it's C.S. Lewis, and the idea is that it's written from an older demon to a younger demon, explaining how to kind of trick his, what they call patient, um, or like lead astray a human. Um, and it's a really interesting, um, yeah, just way of looking at things and perspective to kind of have. Um, so when it talks about screw tape, screw tape's the older demon. He's writing to Wormwood, who's the younger demon. The patient is us, the people. Um, we're also referred to as um, as something, little human vermin at one point. Um, and the enemy is God, and the father below is Satan. So that's all the context. I'm going to read like a a chunk of it because um, I think it really just captures the heart. Um, of, of just like what we miss. Um, but yeah, there'll be some quotes up as well. So it says, My dear Wormwood, I note with grave displeasure that your patient has become a Christian. In the meantime, we must make, make the best of the situation. There is no need to despair. Hundreds of these adult converts have been reclaimed after a brief sojourn in the enemy's camp and are now with us. All the habits of the patient, both mental and bodily, are still in our favour. One of our greatest allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her, spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which our boldest tempters um, make our boldest tempters uneasy. But fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patient sees is the half-finished, sham gothic erection in the new building estate. When he goes inside, he sees the local grocer with a rather oily expression on his face, bustling up to offer him a shiny little book containing a liturgy, which neither of them understands, and one shabby little book containing corrupt texts of a number of religious lyrics, mostly bad and in very small print. When he gets to his pew and looks around him, he sees just that selection of his neighbors whom he has hitherto avoided. He, you want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbours. Um, make his mind flit to and fro between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next pew. It matters very little, of course, what the people in the next pew, what the next, what kind of people the next pew really contains. You may know one of them to be a great warrior on the enemy side. No matter, your patient, thanks to our Father below, is a fool. Provided that one of his one of those neighbours sing out of tune, have boots that squeak, or a double chin, or odd clothes, the patient will quite easily believe that, that re their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. Work hard then on the disappointment or anticlimax, which is coming to the which certainly is coming to the patient during his first few weeks as a churchman. The enemy allows this disappointment to occur on the threshold of every human endeavour. It occurs when the boy who, was in, who has been enchanted in the nursery by stories from the Odyssey buckles down to really learning Greek. It occurs when lovers get married and begin the real task, task of living together. In every department of life, it marks the transition from dreaming aspiration to laborous doing. The enemy takes this risk because he has a curious fantasy of making all these disgusting little human vermin into what he calls his free lovers and servants. Sons is the word he uses. 
Desiring their freedom, he therefore refuses to carry them by their mere affections and habits to any goal that he sets before them. He leaves, uh, he leaves them to do it on their own, and their lies are opportunity. But also, remember, their lies are danger. If once they get through this initial dryness successfully, they become much less dependent on emotion and therefore much harder to tempt. The real church spread out through time, rooted in eternity, um, is so invisible to us sometimes. We see all the things we wish we could change. We see frustrations and awkward people and songs we don't like and messages that weren't that good um, this week and we forget what the church really is. Um, we can have this idealistic picture of what it's supposed to look like and how it would look if we were in charge uh, or how it should serve me, what, it should, what I should get out of it. Uh, and we run the risk of being disappointed um, in, in just the reality of what church really is. We miss the beauty and the power of it. But if we can get through this dryness, if we can get through that frustration, um, we, we can see the church for what it really is and for what God sees it to be. And we can treat other Christians um, or the church based not on our unmet desires, um, but on, yeah, on the, the way that Jesus sees it and the love that he places in us for, for it and for each other. Um, so in this passage, uh, in John, sorry, back in John 13, um, Jesus is giving us direct instructions on how we are to carry out this plan for unity um, and connectedness with one another. <clears throat> and that that's the strategy of, of winning others to us as well. Um, because other people want to be a part of it when they see that. So the strategy that he gives us is that we are to love as I have loved you. And I feel like I always read that passage and saw it as this like huge, unconditional, sacrificial love, and it was this fi like fuzzy ideal idea um, of, of this feeling that I would have towards my brothers and sisters in Christ. And as I was reading it in the weeks following up to this, I was just really struck by the fact that love is meant to look like something. And... Um, yeah, I just thought about how does how does Jesus love us? What does that look like? Um, and how how's that meant to translate into our lives? He's instructing us to love as he has loved. So how has he loved us? So I want to talk about the, a few of the ways that he has has loved us. Um, and yeah, and how we can do that because of his love, um, not because of anything that we've done um, or anything in the, in ourselves. Um, give me one second. Uh, so the first one is that he loves us just as we are. Um, this one hit me hard. Um, he doesn't wait for us to be better. He doesn't ask us to be anything that we're not. He doesn't want us to fix ourselves before we can come to him. He loves us as we are today. And he doesn't leave us there, but he's not asking us to change each other the way that he changes us. Um, he's asking us to love each other the way that he loves us. The next one is that he loves us first. Um, radical hospitality looks like treating people like we love them already. Um, we have to choose to be kind first. We have to choose to reach out first, to invite first. Um, and it's okay if that's scary. Um, this is something I'm very much learning uh, but we can do it because Jesus did it for us. The next one is that he loves us because we are created for love. Um, we're undeserving and unworthy because of our sin, but from the beginning of time, we were created and designed for and out of love. Um, and so we, as children, as his children, as his creation, we are worthy of carrying that love. Um, and so is the person next to you. Um, and what would it look like for us to really capture that, really capture that um, each of us, including ourselves, are worthy of that love? Um, and 
yeah, just see people through the eyes of Jesus and desire to, to love them the way that he has made them worthy of that love. Um, the next one, um, yeah, I feel like this has been just a really interesting lesson recently is that God, God sees our hearts. He sees the messy parts um, and he sees the way that we fumble and the ways that we're trying to live right and the ways that we get up and try again. And he doesn't love us based on our performance on any particular day. He actually really loves our efforts. Um, and he loves that when we mess up, we repent and we try again. And we come back and we do better. And we learn and we grow. Um, and he loves being in that process with us. Uh, and I think it's totally possible for us to to be unified and not have conflict. Um, but I also think that when we're doing life together, when we're serving Jesus together, it's we're going to have points of contention at times. And I think that's okay. Um, a lot of the time, if we're if we're isolating ourselves, we're going to be avoiding conflict. But when we come together and we live the way that God intends, um, there is going to be some conflict. And so um, I think it's actually sometimes a good thing. And it's very okay for us to disagree on things. Um, and um, yeah, and we are sinful people as well. And so we just need to have that understanding. Um, but yeah, it's okay to mess up and have misunderstandings. But if we can look at each other's hearts the way that Jesus does, if we can see, okay, you and I are two people created for love um, and we're people desiring to love and serve Jesus in this moment, then um, I can envision myself going before the Lord, praising him, worshipping him um, and coming with all my mess and my best parts and my worst parts and I can look across and I can see you doing the same. Um, I can see you coming with your best and your worst and um, yeah, then I can see that we're the same. <laughs> um, and, when, and then we won't get caught up in, in distractions and the things that the, the enemy can so easily use to just throw us off of, um, off of what we should be doing. Um, I was on a missions base in Mexico last year and it was one of the most um, just unified, beautiful and fruitful teams. Um, they are just doing incredible work planting churches um, in their city and... Um, yeah, it was it was really cool. We got to sit down and have a and a time with, with some of the team and someone asked how they deal with conflict in their team. Um, and one of the guys said something that really stuck with me and he said, I, I realize that God assumes the best of me and so I try to always assume the best of my team as well. Um, and that was what for him made the biggest difference with not getting offended by other people and staying focused on what God had them there, um, there for. Um, the next one is that he, he loves those that hurt and betray him. This passage comes just after he predicts his betrayal and just before uh, he, this passage that he tells Peter um, that he's also going to betray him. And we know that following his resurrection, he has this moment where Peter is able to repent and receive forgiveness, and the relationship is restored. And this obviously is tricky and complicated, and I don't um, assume to know everything about everyone's individual situations or try to solve all of that. Um, but assuming that we're talking about two people in the church, um, we've all we've all hurt people, we've all been hurt, and um, we can't control the outcome. But as far as we are concerned, we need to know that we have come with repentance and or forgiveness um, and prayed for and fought for restoration and unity um, because that reflects the heart of Jesus and that reflects his heart towards us. And lastly, he loves us because of who he is, not because of who we are. Um, he doesn't love us based on what we deserve, as we've said. Um, in the same way, we are to love people because of the love that he's placed in us. And we don't wait for people to deserve it. Um, we don't decide. We um, we don't yeah decide who's worthy and who isn't. We decide who we are. 
Um, and so we need to decide that we're people that love again and again and again. Um, and that comes from receiving that love from Jesus. I don't have it in and of myself. Um, so I need to go to the source of all love and receive it from him. And um, so this looks like deciding that I'm someone who loves and going to him to receive that love to give. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was really just so blessed by just sitting and listening and and going through scripture, finding the ways that he so deeply and beautifully loves us and what that means for us um, as a church and as as loving each other um, as the global church. And the church, as we've said, is his mission strategy. Um, it's his plan for spreading the gospel and he hasn't given us another one um, and we seem to try and come up with better ideas and different ideas and we turn our backs on the churches at times and, and think that this is all too hard and, and, and too messy and it's not the way it's meant to be. Um, but church is his idea and he loves it. Um, so we want in our own context, in our own way, in our own lives to look like the church in Acts did um, as far as we can, um, as far as we're concerned. And so what this means is we need to meet together, we need to eat together, we need to serve together, and we need to go to him to receive that love. Um, yeah, we need to make space for him in our lives to love each other. And so meeting together means regularly and consistently um, meeting together to worship him together. There's so much power in praising him and glorifying him and being unified in our voices um, as we as we glorify him. Um, and we need to do that regularly. Uh, it's so important. Um, and we need to learn together as well. We need to be seeking him together in his word. Um, and, and that brings unity, just being together and seeking the heart of God, seeking to know him. And then eat together. We, uh, we might think that that sounds like just socializing, but it's so biblical and so important to sit together around tables and just share life. It's so important that we uh, are part of each other's worlds and um, actually just enjoy fellowship, enjoy being together. Um, it's, it's so a part of the heart of God for the church is to enjoy each other's company. Um, and so that's so powerful and so important. And so a plug for after church, we usually go out for dinner and we definitely will tonight. Please join us. We love um, being able to, to sit together and eat together and enjoy each other's company. Um, and yeah. We should do that throughout the week. We should do that, um, you know, with with each other in different ways and people that we wouldn't even normally do that with. Um, but yeah, please join us after church. It's a great time. Um, and serve together. In my experience, serving Jesus with other people is the way that I've um, formed some of my deepest friendships. And the best way to feel connected and com in in community in a church is to serve with people and. Um, yeah, sometimes it's easier to just do your own thing and serve Jesus your own way. Um, but there's a real, there's a real power in, in doing it within teams and coming together. Um, so this could look like doing a ministry in the church, like kids ministry or youth ministry. Um, and I love um, those our team for youth. It's so much fun. Um, and yeah, worship ministry and all of these things like that are in the church. Um, but it also looks like doing outreach stuff together and, um, yeah, getting groups of people together that are passionate about the same things, um, praying for people on the streets or running a Bible study or something, um, but actually just doing those things. And there are so many um, incredible um, teams of people that are doing things in Alice Springs. Um, and we often, there's also so many people doing individual amazing things, and that's great too, um, but we often, um, we often forget to invite people into that and just the power of that um, or to seek that out as well. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, the last one that I've said there is, is, um, the most important thing is, as I've said, all of this, all through, um, through these examples of Jesus love, he loves us like that. And we can't expect to love people like that if we haven't actually met with him 
and spent time with him and received that love from him to give. And so we want to love from an overflow. Uh, we don't want to. We don't want to try and imitate what he's doing, um, and and do it as if we're trying to be like him in some way. Um, we actually want to do it from a heart of this is this is what he's given us, and he's changing our hearts and making us more like him. Um, and that's the that's the the real and deep goal is to is to be one with him in love, um, and to be overflowing with it so that we can extend it to others. Um, so I'm going to pray for us. Um, I'm going to pray for us to, yeah, receive that. Um, and so, yeah, I just ask that you pray with me. Um, and, yeah, just be in a posture to receive um, receive his love and receive revelation of his love. And, um, yeah, just that that will overflow onto, onto others around you. Um, I'm just going to be on my knees. Um, Thank you, Jesus. Um, Thank you for your love, Lord. Lord, we just thank you that you loved us first, Jesus, that you have loved us um, in more ways than we can know, Lord. Um, We we just thank you that um, we have access to the source of all the love we could ever need in the universe. Um, Jesus, we just thank you that you um, that you desire to be with us. You desire for us to receive that love. Um, and so, Jesus, I just pray for each of us today that we will um, be open to what it is that you have to give. We know that we can't love like you in and of ourselves. We need you to help us. We need you to change us. Um, We need to receive that love from you, Jesus. And so I just pray for each of us that you'll just be meeting with us this week, Um, Lord, that you'll be um, opening our hearts up to you and to each other, Um, Jesus, and that your love will overflow. Um, Jesus, give us a love for the church. Um, Help us to love each other, Jesus. And we know your scripture says that if we do that, Others will come to know you, Jesus, and that's our greatest desire, um, Lord. And so we pray that others will will know you and see you um, because of our fellowship and because of our love for each other. Um, yeah, we just thank you, Jesus. Amen. I think the worship team is going to come back up.